when most people come to learn thumb position, it seemed to me that they try and just add it on to what they're already, do, already doing. So they learn these new hand shapes, they shift in and out of thumb position, they shift within, shift within thumb position, and they just do it all, all in one go. And it just seems to me that's not how you, how you should learn to do something. You, I, I thought that you should learn just to play in one hand shape at a time, sit there, really get to know how that feels, Today, we're digging deep into thumb position on the double bass. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contra Bass Conversations, and we are chatting today with Chris West. And Chris just came out with a new book titled Thumb Position on the Double Bass. You guessed it. And Chris has done it all. He played with the Guildhall Strings for years and years. He's played with Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, Philharmonia, Academy of St. Martin in the Fields, English Chamber Orchestra, you name it. If it's in Britain, he's probably played with it. Now, Chris has been using the materials that he's put together for this book for many years. And and why a book? Why now? What's in it? What are some of the things that people struggle with when it comes to thumb position? That's what we dig into today. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Diderio Strings, Upton Bass, and A440, and we'll hear more about them later. And if you'd like to order a copy of this book, check out the show notes or go to Amazon and search for Thumb Position on the Double Bass. So let's dig into this conversation with Chris West. Hey, Chris, how are you doing? Hey, Jason, good to see you. Good to see you too. So your brother is the ballet conductor here in San Francisco. Yeah, Martin, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Wow. Yeah. That's great. So I'm assuming you've been over here in the past. At, yeah, at some a few times, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. He's got an American family now, so you know he's got two young children out there. Sure. So I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's great. It's a it's a lovely town. We've only been out here a couple of a couple of years, but we like right. it a lot. And so, yeah. still kind of getting settled into the whole um, the whole San Francisco Bay Area scene. But, it's a wonderful place. Well, well so it's a, a, thanks for sending along the the book and get this Kindle. So I so I have an iPad, and so I downloaded on the Kind uh, the, on the Kindle app on the iPad, and it's really lovely how it's all. Laid it looks out. quite good, doesn't it, on the Kindle? Oh, yeah. It's Fantastic. Yeah. 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 So, so, maybe, so maybe people don't need the physical one, but I mean, the phys- it's, I've got them, you know, it's, it's here as a, as a paper book, yeah. paper book as well, but you know, maybe the, the iPad version is fine for most people. I, I think it's different for everybody because some people really like marking up the, the paper and writing in and circling things. Yeah. And, I think know. you can do that as well now, can't you? Or yeah. is that just, yeah, you can't, like you, you can, you can highlight yeah. and you can do all sorts of things. And yeah. yeah, I mean, for some people, you know, they really want that physical copy on the bookshelf yeah, yeah, from cool. the music yeah. stand. But for me, I've kind of gone into that whole digital world. So I love having, I, I have my sheet music on my iPad and I have all yeah. my teaching materials on the iPad. And yeah, it really, yeah. it's been clutter. Yeah. Declutter. And I'll tell you the, uh, the I've got the iPad pro and I've got the Apple pencil and it's oh. just, it's a lovely combination because I can write in fingerings and bowings and that sort so of the stuff. pros, the big 12, 12 inch one, is it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which is pretty close to a sheet of paper, you know, yeah. it's, and, and so it's the first thing I found that really can fit that, that, you know, fill that need. So it's been, yeah. it's been, yeah, I've it's seen been people remarkable. use them in, in concerts. Yeah. 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 I have, I'm always worried about the technology. I used it myself in a, in a and the foot recently. pedal, it's showing the pages yeah. and everything. Yeah. So you just sort of have to have faith that you're not going to run out of batteries. <laughs> it's not going to crash. The foot pedal is yeah, going to yeah. work, but so far so good. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's great. It's great to chat with you. And, 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 and it's, and it's, so it's today is the anniversary of, Corin Lung's passing That's is that absolutely true? Yeah, okay. yeah. It was, I only realized after we'd set up the date. Yeah, yeah. it's eleven years today. Yeah. Eleven years, March twenty ninth. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And and when did you two first meet? Um, Corin and I first met. We we were twelve. Okay. He, he he's we're from completely different parts of the country, but we both got into the National Youth Orchestra as, as very young guys, and we sat on the back desk together and we learned and. We, we we played in the National Youth Orchestra all the way through till we were till we left school. By which time we were the front desk together, mm-hmm. and then yeah, we we, we we were. I went to university, but when I did my postgrad at Music College, he that was the Music College. He was there. Oh. So and then we were in. We played in the Philharmonia together. We we taught together at Trinity Laban, and we did sessions together. So yeah, he was just someone I thought was always going to be part of my life. So it was. Yeah. 
a real shock when he, you know, when I got the news about him. I, I, I'm it, sure. It actually, yeah. yeah. I, I, I remember that. I remember that. Uh, uh, well, and yeah, what a shocker, what a shocker to, to just, you know, I think, I think that's the only other time we've contact. I think I contacted you to let mm-hmm. you know at the time. Mm-hmm. I think that's the only other time we've been in, you and I have been in contact. Yeah. 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 What was he? Yeah. What was he like? I never he had the chance oh, to meet him, but <laughs> he, he was a massive personality. He was, he was, you know, tremendous fun to be with. You know, going on tour with him was always, you know, fantastic time. You know, and he very inspiring as a teacher as well. He he had loads of students who did really well, and um, I don't know when. I, he went through different phases in his life, but when he was a young man, he used to have this massive mane of orange hair <laughs> with um, a pendant earring. You know, he was he was very different from most orchestral players that you knew. You know, he because of course it, it, it's a few years ago now, and yeah. uh, so our teachers would say would say to him, you know, you really won't, you really can't look like that and expect to be taken seriously as a classical musician. But he he didn't care. He just carried on, you know, and <laughs> and look, he, you know, he got to be principal of the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, so yeah. it worked for him, didn't it? So. <laughs> Yeah, but we all miss him so much, you know, especially time this, this around this time of the year. I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, yeah. it's good. It's good that we get a it's, it's just a nice happenstance that we were able to connect. Yeah, because you know, like I don't the, know whether you noticed, but my book is dedicated to. Yeah, you, know, you saw that. Yeah, and yeah. and the first edition of it was 2009. Well, <laughs> What's the yeah? Well, what was oh. I? So I've been, uh, you know, I've been using this material for years. Mm-hmm. I. I started teaching and what I wanted wasn't available. So I'd be continually writing things out for students. And, and I found myself writing the same thing for every student that pe- came through. So in the end, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll write it, oh, I'll print it out. And so I, I did each page at a time. And as each student got onto the, to the level, I'd give them the page that, that was relevant. And eventually people would start saying, hey, you know, there's a book here. Why don't you put it all together and make a book? So I said, yes, yeah, great. Yeah. So I, I started sort of adapting it and making it more into a book format and I wrote the foreword and you know how long how these things are you, I as time goes by you know you get busy you're doing other things and and I also I kept changing it you know if I if, if I showed something to a student and they didn't get it and they didn't understand why or, or they found a mistake in the in my music I, I, I'd go away and correct it so mm-hmm. it, it felt like a project that had never been finished Mm-hmm. And it was always there on the back burner, and I was using it, and I've been pe- teaching people from it from ten, for ten years, and um, and uh, in fact, some of my colleagues use it as well in the sort of loose leaf, just sort of random pages I've given them to use, and they, they've had good results with it. But um, yeah, it's only recently that suddenly, um, it, it, but it never felt like you know it, I thought, thought it would be a big job to try and get somebody interested in publishing it because it's such a small market, isn't it? We. I mean, so publishers might be interested in stuff for beginner double bass, but the idea of producing something which is just aimed at advanced players was never really going to happen. So, but then there's this whole thing now of Amazon self-publishing and, you know, you you can just upload it and it's there and it'll be there forever. Mm-hmm. And if it sells one copy a year, that's that's absolutely fine. Some, it's of use to somebody. And if it sells a lot of copies, that's fine as well. But it, there's no longer the problem that you have to have a print run of a of a thousand copies before you even can get an idea like this off the ground. So yeah, it's, it just seemed the right time. I, I left the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra last year as well. So I've had a little bit more free time than, because that is such a busy organization. Mm-hmm. So I, I had a bit, bit of time and I thought, yeah, I'll get, get on and get the book finished and make it available to people. It's well, it's and what a great set of tools we have with that Amazon publishing. Uh, you know, I, I, I've done that myself right, for a project I was working on back in 2016. And if, if folks haven't haven't checked that out, it's just a remarkable way to to get that out there. And gone are the days of having to have a, a dusty box of 400 copies of your own book, you know, in, in, yeah, yeah. in your back room and and you dig them out and you pull. It's just so easy. And then people can if they want the physical copy, they can get it. If they want the digital copy, they can get it. And exactly. I really I love just the way you've got this whole base base camp sort of analogy and the sort of like like you know <laughs> explore. It's a really it's a it's a really charming way and and friendly oh, way to present thumb position. That's that's yeah. really wonderful. Well, I, I thought I thought it just helps to give people an idea of what they're trying to achieve at each stage in the book. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah. It, so you've had a chance to look at it. This, this uh, is really exciting for me because so far I've used it myself a lot and people who I know have used it. So if, the, if there's been anything they didn't understand, they could chat to me about it and we could, I could explain it. But this is my first chance to talk because we, we've never met. I know. So it's my first chance to talk to someone who just sees the book first. And can, you know, does it make sense? It, it makes sense and it's wonderful and I love it. And I, I've been, I've gone through the whole thing and I've been taking notes. And so I've got, I, I have a couple, you know, I did just like some of the things in there and, and it's, yeah, it's, it's a great mixture of, of, of a few things I've used in the past and some ideas that are new to me um, and, and, and different, different ways of explaining some of these different positions. And so I totally identify with, with uh, what you've done uh, in terms of, you know, like you've, you've definitely built on the foundation that Petrachi laid out yes, uh, yeah. in his so that, book. That's something that I think will most of your listeners be familiar with. The Petrachi maybe, maybe, t- maybe talk a bit through that because you've, you've taken that and sort of built upon that. Maybe explain, Explain those three fundamental positions that yeah, he's okay. got. Hi, this is David Moore. I'm a professor at the USC Barton School of Music as well as a bassist in the LA Philharmonic. Gosh, I've been using um, Diodario Kaplan's for the past several years, the, the heavies especially in the orchestra as well as on the bass that I have at USC. I just really like the the versatility that they give, especially dynamically, they just respond well in soft dynamics and well in loud dynamics that can really um, take anything that I can dish out. And they're just a really well-balanced string across all of my instruments. I've also used the Zyx strings more kind of in an experimental way. I'm honestly looking for sort of the the combination in the sweet spot between the two of those because I really like the the ring and the response and the tension of the Zyx with um, some of the more conventional characteristics of the Kaplan's. I'm hoping that that's something that's in the works someday in the future. Hope that helps. Whenever anybody's going to the Midwest, and I lived in Chicago, Illinois for years and years, I tell them to go to A440. If they're looking for a bow, if they're looking for a bass, if they need some repairs done, if they have a student who's looking for an instrument, A440 has been serving the community for years and years. They're located just west of Wrigley Field in beautiful Chicago. They do great work, and they've been a big supporter of bass events over the years, whether it's the Chicago Bass Festival or really any bass event. A440, you guys rock. Check them out at a440violinshop.com. So Petraki's idea is that you form three basic handshapes in thumb position. Uh, the chromatic hand shape, which I also call the closed hand shape, where mm-hmm. you just have a semitone between each finger. So that's quite easy to understand. So that'd be G, A flat, A, B flat. Mm-hmm. That'd be your starting point. And then the second hand shape, which he calls the semi-chromatic, which is a bit of a mouthful, and I sometimes call the open hand shape. Mm-hmm. Um, you just put a tone between your thumb and first finger. So that's now G, A, B flat, B. And then the final handshape, which he calls a diatonic handshape, I sometimes call the extended handshape, is G-A-B-C. So that's a bit bit more of a stretch. Mm -hmm. And his idea is that you should learn these three handshapes and then use them all over the the fingerboard in thumb position. So you you would have your thumb on any old... So if you did the diatonic on thumb on B-flat, then you'd be playing B-flat, C, D, Mm E-flat. And and so this is your basic framework for fingering anything in thumb position. So it's a, it was a brilliant idea. You know, I was 14 when his, his book came out and um, we all devoured it. And it suddenly started explaining, gave us a way of organizing what we were doing up in the upper reaches of the base. Because it had been a bit of a free for all up to that point, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. You found a finger that happened to work and then you sort of tried to guess. I, th- I think people thought it was about where the note was on the fingerboard. You'd see in, in double bass rooms, you'd see diagrams of huge, great fingerboards with every note on the fingerboard marked on a, on a, like on a guitar fret, as, as though you were expected to know where they were and then just pick them out with your finger. Now, I don't think that's the way to play, and I don't think Petraki thought that was the way to play. The idea, the, it's much better to have this framework of a hand shape and then move from one hand to another. And- so... 
and it's one of those things that that uh, like when we're in the lower positions, I think people uh, uh, immediately think of having a frame and a hand shape. If your first finger's on A and the G string, you know that that second finger's over B flat. You know that fourth finger's yeah. over B. But yeah, I remember when I learned thumb position myself. You know, it was just this sort of bl- my hand was just this blob up there, kind of like searching around for the notes. So I love that concept of those different frames. Yeah, and and then the thing was, if you I've got the Petraki's original book here. The only problem is he just sort of says that on page one, yeah. and then you're expected to know how to do it. Mm-hmm. And this, he presents all the shapes all in one go and a few extra weird distorted versions. Okay. And whereas when you start to play, when you play in the low positions, I don't know, you, you probably spend two or three months, well, maybe more longer than that, just playing in half position, just just getting ha- knowing how that hand shape feels and not moving around and just getting it really secure and playing all sorts of tunes in half position or first position and before you start trying to shift around and do other stuff. Now, when most people come to learn thumb position, it seemed to me that they try and just add it on to what they're already do- already doing. So they learn these new hand shapes, they shift in and out of thumb position, they shift within, shift within thumb position, and they just do it all, all in one go. And it just seems to me that's not how you, how you should learn to do something. You, I, I thought that you should learn just to play in one hand shape at a time, sit there, really get to know how that feel, feels, Build up your myelin in your brain. Now, th- this is something I'd really like to talk about. Do you, do you, is this Please. myelin concept, is this something you, you know about? It, it, yeah, and the, the talent code. And that was another one of those things that like, really like, made my head explode when I started to le- uh, learn about that. Can, can, you, is it, can you talk about that concept for people? Oh, that, I'd love to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Every student I, I, I ever have, I tell them, you must read this book, The Talent Code by Daniel Coyle. And I don't know whether they ever do or not, but they should do. And I'm going to keep saying it to everybody whether they do or not, because it explains how your brain works. It explains what's happening in your brain when you're practicing. So it shows you how to practice in a useful way and it shows you how to teach in a useful way. It basically what he he says is that um, every time you do something, uh, as we know, your brain's made up of neurons and synapses. The neurons fire. They send messages down the synapses. And some pathway is created every time the smallest move you ever make that happens. So what Daniel Coyle explains in his book is that every time you do something, your brain wraps a layer of this stuff, myelin, which is an insulator down the route that your path, that that pathway took, which just makes it slightly easier for it to do that route again the next time. So if you do it again, it puts another layer around and you keep doing it. It wraps a thicker and thicker layer of myelin around this this pathway in your brain. So whereas you start off having to think about what you're doing, you have to think exactly where you're putting your fingers. If you keep doing it, eventually it becomes an automatic skill so that now I can just put my hand out and I know all the fingers are in a position to play um, semi-chromatic hand shape in thumb position because I just did it a lot of times next to each other. But the key is it... Is, is to do it over and over again and getting it right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What the, the problem is sometimes with people's practice is that they, they practice in a way where they're getting it right half the time and wrong half the time. And so they're practicing the wrong way just as much as the, as the right way. Mm-hmm. So you, you have to find some way of splitting it down into really small skills that you can guarantee you're going to get right. And when, when you're guaranteeing you're getting them right, you just get on it and you practice away at it and you and you it feels really great when you can visualize that myelin just forming and you know you, what it is you're doing to try and get better so so that was my idea is to take what i've learned from daniel coyle and teach thumb position like that so instead of trying to shift up to into thumb position play a tune come back down and finish off the rest of the piece i wanted to come up with some tunes that where you just stayed with your hand in a, a nice chromatic hand shape and played a little tune mm-hmm. and so i wrote a few i mean i didn't make them up but i just found tunes that worked and i put them in my book and then i realized hey these are just the same notes that you played when you when you did that half position study when you first started mm-hmm. playing the bass mm-hmm. so i wrote that in the book as well go go away and dig out your old copy of whatever it is you learned with i don't know simandl or maybe there's probably more fun modern things now with better tunes in and just try playing them up an octave and so that's what I get my students to do. 
and some, oh, you know, very quickly they became really good at, at thumb position. Yeah, there's some. It just there's, came natural to them. It's, yeah, no, it's great. There's something about that connect, making when students make that connection between half position being or, or the half first position and then the similarity to that base thumb position you know it's like you can yeah. see the light bulb you know turn on and and all of a sudden you realize oh i can th these notes down here here they are up here it's just like yeah. a little mini mini base up there you know yeah and, well it's and, great if people realize that yeah yeah and i and so you're you start uh with the semi-chromatics you start with all the fingers together and then you go to the i'm sorry i'm uh yeah you I start think, with no, the I, chromatic right chromatic yeah, yeah, this, first, yeah right then semi-chromatic and yeah. oh and then you go to the diatonic and yeah. and so you but you you have students stay in that chromatic uh position for a while right you, you sort well, of i get, think i would recommend you spend i mean it's Eight, you know, so I've got two pages in my book mm -hmm. on chromatic handshake, mm -hmm. and I reckon that's a, that's a week's work. I think. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I would send a student away with those first two pages, and they'd work on everything on those two pages and, and the and the background stuff, and hopefully they'd come back after a week, and that would feel quite comfortable. And if there were yeah. problems still, then I'd say, no, this isn't working. You know, your second finger's in the wrong place. You know, this isn't this isn't how it should be. Uh, go away and do it for another week, but most mostly it's it's, it's not rocket science. So, <laughs> so most people, after a week of that, they've really got that one hand shape fixed because they're okay. not trying to do anything else at the same time. Yeah. They can concentrate on sorting out the problem, and then for, for the next week, they'd look at the next two pages, which is the semi-chromatic, mm -hmm. and then the week after they'd be learning the diatonic, and you know it all happens quite quickly. But still, by that stage, they've still never moved from having their thumb on the harmonic G. Mm -hmm. So that, 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 that they've not got any further than that at that stage, and then there's other skills to learn. One thing that has impressed me about Upton Bass ever since I got to know them was how many artists there are out there that are so satisfied with the work that Upton has done for them. Here's David White, active bassist on Broadway, and this is both touching and funny and tragic just the saga of his base and his experiences great experiences with upton base here we go i have to mention upton base in connecticut because you'll see why when i tell you this story those guys have really bailed me out and eric specifically has become a good friend he's a very very nice guy the story of my upright is kind of long but i'll keep it as short as i can my grandmother who i was very close with passed away before my senior year of high school. And she was always a very big supporter of me playing. And uh, she always came to every concert, was the loudest cheerleader. Anyway, when she passed away, she was kind enough to leave money for me to be able to purchase a professional instrument. And for a long time, I had been looking around, trying to find some stuff. And I said, you know, I, I really like these vintage instruments, but, you know, I didn't want to spend... 30, 40 grand on something that I just kind of liked. So just kind of searching, I stumbled upon Upton and I said, you know what, I think I want to get a new instrument built, something to my specifications. And it was also very an, an, an intensely personal process for me because of, because of the history with my grandmother. Anyway, I went to them and they bent over backwards to make this beautiful 7 8 space. And I had gotten it and I was playing a tour of Guys and Dolls and I set it on a chair and my foot got caught in a cable and down she went and I cracked mm -hmm. off the entire scroll. Now, the funny thing was I happened to be in New London, Connecticut, which is about six miles down the road from their shop. So uh, Dave, who runs their website, ran over, gave me a rental base, took my, my damage base, went away with it and uh, fixed it up. You would think that's the end of the story, but it's not. So I got the new instrument back after I had dried all my tears I got her back she was as good as new and I brought her on the bridges tour and I have her in a big Colsteins case and in the process of it getting shipped from Dayton Ohio to uh, Fayetteville Arkansas it got a really really nasty hit from behind cracked through the case right where the button is at the neck got cracked the neck came out of the body and the top rib cracked. So that's the second time that it had gotten basically demolished. And again, dried my tears and said, okay, how do we fix this? 
sent it up to Connecticut, and unfortunately, they they said, you know, look, it's beyond what we can do. In the process for that, I said, okay, well, let's let's get a travel instrument built. So I use Upton basses. I love them. But at the moment, <laughs> I'm waiting for a new instrument to get built. In the process of all of this, I had talked to, to Barry Colstein and said, I don't know what to do. I need a rental base, but it can't just be a plywood because of the nature of the show. I need something that can kind of have the orchestral resonance. I had talked to Barry, and he's like, well, I have... I have some bases here that you could use. Just let me know. Come to the shop. You know, we'll get you hooked up, all that stuff. And he really he really saved me in that respect. He rented me, uh, oh, I can't remember for the life of me what the model base is, but it's it's one of his new bases that he's been working with a shop in Hungary. They do a bunch of the, the work over there, and then they send it to get finished at the shop on Long Island. He got me that, a bow, and a, uh, and a flight case for that base. At the moment, that's my rental base, and I'm waiting for Upton to finish building the new one. So the short answer to the upright question is I play Uptons when I can unless they're completely demolished. <laughs> Learn more at UptonBase.com, and thanks for sponsoring the podcast, guys. And when do you introduce this? I, I struggle with this so much. I never know when to start digging into thumb position with a student. D is this something that like a, a student Ooh. starts and they've been playing for a – uh, you know, some people start them within the first few months up in thumb position. Some people wait several years. What what has worked for you in terms of that? <laughs> oh, that's, that's a really good question. I mean, actually, I don't teach many people from beginner. Yeah. I'm teaching at music college, and I used to teach at, at a junior music college. Mm -hmm. So all the people that are coming to me had were already pretty good at the double bass. They right. got in. So the the ones at music college, I'm stripping back their technique. I'm starting everything from the, from the ground floor upwards. And so I'm working through it quite quickly. Yeah. They'll come to me in September. We'll probably spend the first time, first term. We'd only be playing in the lower part of the instrument. Maybe sometime towards Easter, we'd be starting to then sorting out what was going on at the upper end of the, okay. of the instrument. Okay. Um, and the younger players, I suppose, I don't know, I suppose, yeah, they, they were, usually the people that came to me were the people who who were just about ready to start learning this. Sure. sure. I was really lucky. I had some really talented pupils there, you know, at, at, this is at the Junior Royal Academy, you know, and some of those people, uh, well, I mean, they, they all seem to be principal of the National Youth Orchestra by the time they left me. And uh, actually, one of them's just got a job with the Concertgebouw Orchestra, which is really exciting. You know, he's a young guy in his 20s. Oh, that's wonderful. And, yeah, so, so uh, you know, it seems like it worked, whatever it was we were doing together. Well, you know, you've got to, you describe a concept, and I, I love the way you describe it. I'm going to start using this in my own lessons about rolling the hand to keep first finger from collapsing. Because I can't tell you how many times I see you know students come in and and as soon as even if they if the, even if they get the first finger curve they go to that second or third finger and that first finger buckles can, can you yeah. talk about the the way you describe rolling the hand and that that technique oh well i don't know really I, the, it's, it's funny isn't it when when you start teaching because because when, when we play and learn everything's about thinking about things and then putting them into your subconscious mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I had a whole load of stuff in my mind that was totally buried that I was doing automatically and not thinking about at all. And suddenly when you start teaching, you then have to start excavating it and yeah. trying to work out what it was that you, you did in the first place to get this stuff. So this is a, a technique which I, I've been doing forever, which is to, so as you stretch from the, the first finger on the A to the second finger on the B, that first finger just starts to roll over a bit. So it's pointing backwards on the string. So it's still touching the right place on the string. Uh, it's probably not how you would choose to stop the note if the second finger wasn't down, but it's, it's still in the right place. And then as you play, put the third finger down, which is where the, you know, you're still stretching that little bit more. By now, the, second, the first finger is really rolled a long way over, but it's still touching the right place. So as you release, it just, it, it, your hand rolls back and, you, and you're... You, you're still in tune yeah so 
that, that, that I suppose that's, is that, does that explain your? It, it does. Uh, it's a great concept because I, I've worked with students and they just don't understand how, like how to put the next finger down without letting that first finger either move or collapse or something. But that role, I just really like the way that it's laid out in your book. Like, like so I've just, put a few little photographs yeah. of, of what's going on. You know, that, that, as you can see, the, the, as, as the each finger goes down, you can see how that first finger gets more and more rolled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you eventually you get you get you start to get out of uh, the you know you, the student gets comfortable with the chromatic semi-chromatic diatonic and then it's time to move and yeah. <laughs> and you talk through uh, different ways to get into and out of that thumb position using so a I harmonic. think that's an important yeah. skill and it it seems to me that that's never really addressed in, in mm -hmm. most of the books I've ever done you know you as soon as you've learned thumb position you're expected to go in and out and just fly up and down and. Actually, that's one of the most awkward things, isn't it? Making that transition. Mm -hmm. And you have to think when you're playing in thumb position, you have to think exactly where am I going to have my elbow? Because it's a slightly different. It's quite low when you're playing in the lower positions. And then you just have to raise it a little bit to clear that neck as you go over the, over the shoulder of the bass. And so that's making that smooth transition to have the elbow in a, in a nice place for both positions is really important. So I, I I've got some exercises in the book about changing from – it's using um, – well, it's what Samandel calls the sixth position, but I, I started calling it the passing position, mm -hmm. where you put your third finger on harmonic G. And from there, you can either play with your – as though it's a low position with your thumb beside, beside the neck, or you can play it as a thumb position with the thumb right over on – probably on an E. Yeah. So – I recommend people spend quite a long time playing those F, F sharp G and keep bringing the thumb in and out, getting used to that movement. So again, you're doing it on its own. You're not trying to do it while finding a note. The notes are there already. All you're doing is checking the, the mechanics of the movement is working correctly. And so eventually you can, you can then just start going. So eventually I would be playing, say, playing my B flat major scale and I get to F and G while I'm playing F and G, that elbow is coming up, the thumb's coming round, and I've, I've moved into thumb position without doing a shift. And so then everything becomes that much smoother. So that's that's one of the sections in my books. I'm on the two pages on moving in and out of thumb position. And... Uh, it's it's yeah. It's a, so, it's so a... I try to be thorough about it, you know, so that people, like I say, so you could so you can form your myelin, get those pathways in your brain automated, uh, for all aspects of it, without trying to do everything in one go. I like the way you describe that as the passing position, because that really is a, a nice way to think of it. Because it's really not a lower position; it's really not a thumb position. It, yeah, it's, but it, oh, but it's it both. is. Depending yeah, it's both. It, yeah. both. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, you also talk about uh, the minor arpeggio. What was the term you used? Uh, the, like the if you the spacing of the minor arpeggio <laughs> and and the similarity, well, right? That's my big secret, and it's out there for the whole world now. <laughs> I, I really have never heard anybody. Did, did you know? Had you come across that before? No, I, had you I, thought about it before? I, I, so I'll, I'll better explain yeah. to the listeners what we're talking about. Yeah? yeah. So my question was: once you start shifting, so we're now quite a bit further on into the book. We now we've we've learned the hand shapes. Um, we've learned how to swap between the hand shapes. We've practiced playing all the hand shapes in different positions. And now we're going to start shifting between these different positions. And obviously, as you move higher, the notes get closer together. Everybody knows that. And so that means if you go from a chromatic hand shape up to a, a higher chromatic hand shape, then obviously the hand gets smaller. Everybody knows that. But what if you go from a chromatic hand shape to a higher semi-chromatic hand shape? So it's, 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 the notes are close together, but it's a, it's a wider interval. So how do I know whether my hands got bigger or got smaller? And this was something I puzzled with and, and thought about for some time, because I thought, well, I must know this. Otherwise, how am I going to play in tune? And what I realized was that if you play a minor arpeggio on one string, all those notes are the same distance apart on the fingerboard. And once you know that, then you can work out which hand shapes are smaller and which hand shapes are bigger. Mm -hmm. 
And if you don't believe me that that's true, you can test that by playing the different artificial harmonics. If you play a G and touch a B flat, if you touch a B, play a B flat and touch a D, or if you play a D and touch a G, all those produce the same note. So they're all they're, they're, that's the same length of string vibrating in each case. So that that proves that they are the same distance apart. And once you once you know that, then it makes it makes life a lot, a lot of things a lot easier. So, I mean, for instance, one of, one of the things I show people is, you know, that last note in the first minute of the Kusevitsky Concerto. We've all been there. We've all been doing it in an audition. And you're worrying, am I going to hit the last note in tune? Is it going to be right? And, and for most, you know, for most of my life, it was sort of aim and hope. And then once I discovered this about minor arpeggios, it's no longer aim and hope because now I'm, I've got my thumb on G, I'm playing third finger on B. All I have to do is move my thumb to B and keep the hand size the same. same. And the top E is guaranteed to be in tune. It's brilliant. <laughs> so that, was the, that is the great minor arpeggio secret. And for years, whenever I told anybody that, I always used to make sure all the windows were closed and <laughs> shut the door outside, you know, and said, this, you know, nobody else knows this, so this is our secret. Don't go and tell anybody else. But now I've written down in books, everybody knows it now. So, <laughs> so hopefully everybody can go on and use it and find, and find even more ways of how, how it can help, people, help us to play in tune up there. Well, I bet a lot of people just pressed pause on our conversation, and went over and ran to the bass and just tested that out for themselves. So, so just to make sure they got it right, it's G to B flat, B flat to D, D to G. Test those artificial harmonics. They're all going to be the same. Yeah. Wow. Love it. Because <laughs> I, I, I wrote a book before, actually. Uh, which was my guide to double bass harmonics. It's the world's most boring book. It's got 350 <laughs> harmonics in for the double bass. Unfortunately, it's too short to be published by Amazon. So, <laughs> oh, um, is it really? <laughs> or, in, as a physical thing, it, it's there. You can download it as a as an iPad one, but it's just like, for each note, it just shows you all the different ways you can you can make those notes. So it's probably while while I was working on that that it suddenly occurred to me this idea about how far apart the notes were. Yeah. Well, that that in and of itself is a valuable resource and not just for bass players, but for conductors and for composers and for people yeah. who just want to like demystify all this sort of like, where is that? What did Ravel mean by that harmonic? You know, how well, many times have we asked that question, you know? Oh yeah. I mean, Ravel was pretty inconsistent, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah. yeah but it's funny. It's interesting you say that it's uh, useful for lots of people because you'll, I got an email from Steve Vai and I don't know whether everybody will know who Steve Vai is, but he was one of Frank's Zappa a stunt guitarist and the you know, most awesome rock guitarist and he wrote to me asking for, for a copy of my book and I was thrilled to bits by that because that's a guy who I've listened to playing since you know since I was a teenager so that that that, that was a real thrill for me wow that is high I don't, high know why he, I don't know why he wanted I don't know what he was planning to do with it but like you say it's the same thing on guitars isn't it so it's, it's the same principle the same yeah but that is high I mean I as a huge Frank Zappa fan and Steve oh, you too? I fan, oh I had all his in audio cassette form I think you know all his different solo projects and that that's high praise indeed to have Steve Vai asking for a, a copy of your harmonic book so I was thrilled to bits, yeah. yeah yeah so because there's well, a man who can do anything on a string instrument so you know, if he thinks he can learn something from me, then I'm very flattered. Well, I just, I just love the way that you've got this laid out. I think it's, 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 it's obviously the work of someone who's spent a lifetime teaching people, you know, in person and thinking through these things. And it's a real mystery zone for so many bass players out there at, at all sorts of different ages. And so I, I Folks, pick up pick up Chris's book, and while you're at it, get get that harmonic book. That's a useful resource that that should be in every bass player's library. Oh, thanks very much. Thanks for chatting, Chris. Such a pleasure. We definitely have to have you on for a round two where we dig into your career. You had a fascinating career. And folks, if you want to pick up that book, again, show notes for this episode, or just go to Amazon and search for Thumb Position on the Double Bass. And while you're at it check out that harmonics book too. That's very cool. And if this is your first episode or your 475th episode or whatever episode number this is, 
Thank you for joining us, and I'd love it if you subscribed to the podcast. And how do you do that? What does that mean? That's all on our website at ContraBasedConversations.com slash subscribe. It's totally free, and you can get our podcast through Apple Podcasts, through Stitcher, through Spotify, or through our ContraBased Conversations app, which we have for iOS, Android, Kindle, all that sort of stuff. And I'd love to hear from you, too. Tell me what you thought of today's episode or what you might want to hear in the future. You can reach me at feedback at ContraBasedConversations.com. And I love opening up my email and, and seeing messages. Every day I get these messages from people that are listening to the podcast and are enjoying it or have some direction that they like to see it go. And I take all that information, by the way, this big spreadsheet, and I put in feedback and thoughts and directions. And that's what I use to shape the show over the months and years. So I'd love you to be a part of this in any way that you like. Thanks again for listening. And this podcast is a team effort. Contrabass Conversations is produced by Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mooring. And if you're looking for a double bass, Mitch Mooring is making beautiful instruments down in the Dallas area. So check him out online at MitchMooring.com. I'm your host, Jason Heath, coming to you each and every week from San Francisco, California, where we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.